So um, let's go ahead and jump into it. You know, first off, I wanted to thank uh, Valerie and Graham for presenting this morning. It is, you know, I continuously am amazed by our clients presenting year in and year out. This is our fourth straight year doing user conferences, sometimes multiple a year. And, um, you know, just to hear the stories that our clients tell, something that we should be really proud of as a company, but also, you know, it's quite unique because you have people in different industries, different company sizes, different software modules, et cetera, that are getting great benefit from these demand-driven solutions. And uh, I just think it continually proves to the market that, you know, uh, this thing really works. And simple can be great. And uh, I appreciate our clients sharing their stories. So um, today I'm going to take, take us through really two things, the roadmap for into flow for the year 2022. And then I'm also going to go a little bit deeper on what we're doing with machine learning and the application to help improve our buffer settings. You know, Graham at the very end of his conversation there with Eric talked about, uh, you know, small tweaks and things can always be helpful to improve the software, make it lively. You know, you're looking at the same screens day in and day out. It's a lot of data, rows of data, uh, so on and so forth. And I thought that was really uh, cool that he said that because what I'm going to show today is, uh, in a, I think, a very exciting new user interface that we're building for our Intuitive Flow suite of solutions. And uh, so I hope you're excited as I am. And, uh, you know, we'll be looking for client feedback after, after the meeting, uh, such that we can really build a beautiful and uh, highly easy to use solution uh, together. So let's jump in. Here's the agenda. First, I'm going to cover. So yesterday I covered what we've already produced in the you know, beginning of this year and what we released with the first Intuitive version. Today, I'm going to talk about our upcoming version, which is 2022.2, uh, that's going to be released in the second quarter of this year. We're going to go in detail through all of the new features that are going to be surfaced there. We're going to talk about that new user interface. Um, I'm going to dive into machine learning, uh, which will be, be released this summer as well for users to start testing and using. And then we'll take some time to look at a forward looking roadmap for the balance of 2022 and ultimately the vision that we have for our product, um, you know, in the long term over the next one, two, three years even. Uh, so that's exciting. Let's get right into it. So in Q2, our Intuit Flow release, here are the, you know, high level features that we're planning to release. Uh, so really exciting new stuff uh, to build and improve upon the Intuit Flow platform. Um, first and foremost, as I mentioned, the UI refresh. It's going to be awesome. It's on the next slide. We're going to build a Gantt view for scheduler, load optimization. We're going to improve our distribution module. Uh, we're going to provide a long-awaited feature for part-level ADU horizons. We'll talk about two-tier architecture migrating from DVR Plus on-prem to Intuit Flow. And then ultimately, we'll dive into the uh, AI ML stuff. All right. Here is a uh, screenshot uh, really design for our new user interface for Intuit Flow. So um, a lot's changing, right? We've got this great new, beautiful brand that Nicole and the team have put together. And now we're going to surface that in the software in a way that I think is uh, seamless in that our users won't have to learn a whole new system or workflow for their day-to-day uh, their -day activity. But at the same time, um, really gives a fresh look, feel, and uh, uh, interface for our customers to use that's more modern and appropriate for uh, the vast client base that we have. So I'll walk through a few things on the screen. This is our dashboard, right? When you log into Intuit Flow for the first time, just as you do today, you've got your planning priorities. Now we've got it across the top. Then you have your execution alert information here listed below. So same functionality that we had previously, just looking a little bit different. We'll still be able to click on these tiles and go straight into our planner's workbench. Down below, we're gonna redo the um, Intuit Flow scheduling dashboard to be a little more visual and less data and uh, text heavy. Um, so that bottom portion where it says work orders is really for the scheduling users in Intuit Flow. Otherwise, quite the same. Um, we're going to be allowing clients to adopt their logo at the top bar alongside our Intuit Flow logo, which I think will be great. 
um, because we'll be able to have QA or dev or something for our other instances to, to differentiate them visually for our clients. Um, on the top right, we still have the same quick access buttons. Depending on how your screen is sized, those will be spelled out or will be the icons like what you see here. Um, so sort of the same functionality. That search bar that I mentioned yesterday as part of the scheduling functionality will be at the top for scheduling clients. And then one of the most critical changes that we're making is we're moving our current, what we call hamburger menu on the right-hand side of our software, the dropdown that shows all the options. We're moving it over to an expandable left-side menu. This is a really critical thing because um, if you are a user of all three modules in Intuflow, all three main modules in Intuflow, meaning materials planning, SNOP, and scheduling, our menu has become quite long, right? As we've grown features, functionality, um, there are a lot of landing pages and, uh, and button clicks and the menus become quite expansive. So we've kind of um, put it on the left side and it'll be expandable. So you click on materials planning, it'll show you all the things relevant for that right there. You can click on the top left and hide that menu very easily. So where it's just icons on the left side, um, so on and so forth. All of this will be um, you know, sizable, mobile friendly, tablet friendly, et cetera, just like it is today. So um, obviously a drastic change, but again, if you think about the functionality that we're supporting here, not a lot's changing from a workflow standpoint, which is really important. If I go to the next page, we will show our, um, our planner's workbench, the new view for our planner's workbench. Again, same functionality today, you still have the new workbench or workbench preview function um, with the new branding, new colors. Um, we're trying to eliminate you know, the large header that we have today as to give more vertical workspace for our users to see more rows of data, right? So this is quite zoomed in in this um, specific screen, but as you zoom out, we'll actually earn real estate as it relates, relates to seeing parts in our new workbench, which is really, really important for us as we set about this journey. Um, same, you know, grouping functionality at the top, you can still save views, et cetera, um, still manage orders. So um, quite similar, but at the same time, very, very fresh. I'm very, very pleased with how this is uh, coming out. And uh, if you have any questions about this, or if you'd like to study this in more detail, we're happy to meet with you and, and earn your feedback on that. Um, all right, so let's jump into some of the features. This is just a Power BI screenshot of what we're gonna be doing with our Gantt scheduling view. Quite typically in a scheduling context, um, software companies will have a visual Gantt view, sometimes drag and drop, sometimes not in the software. And we're gonna be adding that. It won't look like this, it'll be a bit more uh, friendly. Um, but the point is that we're gonna be able to see uh, the Gantt view for work orders, parts and resources in different views for our scheduling users. Uh, and I think that will be a great value add um, such that our planners can really visually understand the flow of production uh, throughout their schedule. This is a feature that I'm quite excited about and has been on the roadmap for some time. It's called load optimization. And what this is, is the ability to group parts together uh, for purchasing, manufacturing, or distribution, and then you know, put out a certain quantity of units or some unit of measure optimized using the prioritize share DDMRP rules. So we have many clients that need to build truckloads or full containers or have um, you know, pallets that they need to fill a truck, et cetera. And really this will allow that by having clients group of, have a group of parts saying, hey, I need to order 52 pallets. What should be the best order using prioritize share logic? It will output that and then allow you to accept those orders into the pending orders table. Um, we're gonna use the manage orders interface, looks like this, to accommodate this logic. So again, on the workbench, you'll select a group of parts, maybe for, perhaps for a vendor and say, for this total vendor, I need to order um, you know, 100 pallets. And using our packaging quantity functionality that exists in the software today, you'll be able to optimize and type in a packaging quantity, optimize, and it will basically spit out a new reorder quantity using the same logic that we use in our stock or our uh, distribution module for prioritize share. Ultimately getting us to some topped off packaging quantity, and then we'll show units right here. 
Once you accept that, it will move right over to pending orders. So I'm pretty excited about this. Um, I think this is a critical bit of functionality when you're talking about ordering uh, and you know, obeying some logistics constraints, things of this nature. So I'm excited for our customers to get to use this feature and uh, really tell us how they're using it, right? And all the different use cases that will come out of it. And you can see as well, this is a new, the new UI for our manage order screen um, that you're seeing here. In 2022.2, we will be um, enhancing our distribution module, formerly known as stock deployment module. Uh, we've listened to our users over the last year who use this great piece of functionality, and we're going to be modifying it such to make it more usable and capture more use cases for our clients. Um, Right now, if you are if you have a stock deployment managed part, you cannot edit that in Workbench. That is simply you can take it to the API or an export, um, but the allocations for those parts are non-editable. The first thing we're doing, and perhaps the most imperative, is we're making that editable in the Workbench for anybody that has a new role called Distribution Administrator. So users that use stock deployment uh, will still have the little truck icon, I believe, on their items in the Workbench, but they'll actually be able to go and edit those allocations. Um, before the API um, comes and grabs those orders, uh, at least in a lot of use cases. We will also be adding non-buffered parts um, to make them available for use in the stock deployment module. Basically, um, for clients that want to use the same ordering technique for more parts, buffered and non-buffered in this case, uh, it'll run just like the buffered parts, only we will prioritize the allocation of units for non-buffered parts by to order, make to order, distribute or distribute order in this case, uh, before we actually move to the allocation for the remaining buffered parts. Uh, so this is an exciting new addition as well, and I think this will create more automation and uh, and you know easier total use case for aggregate uh, client data. We are going to add a new tab to the part pop out on the workbench. So today, guys, you you know click a part in the workbench pops out a little modal, you've got your all activity, your part details, your buffer size, and your part analytics, so on and so forth. There will be a new tab if the part is managed by the distribution module, where you'll be able to see the prioritized share um, output and allocations for that part, just as you would in the actual distribution or stock deployment tab, um, but a little more readily available, I think, as we're surfing through the workbench. Um, so that's an exciting user interface bit. Uh, in addition to these other great new additions. Okay, make sure I'm not missing any questions. No questions so far. If you do have any questions about these features, feel free to chime in and I will do my best to answer them. All right, a long awaited uh, feature that seems quite simple. We've been really resistant over the years to add part level overrides for ADU FDU Horizon. Um, because we want to keep it simple for our users, right? We want to make sure that um, our users have the ability to maintain the system with ease and don't have to get into the nitty gritty of every part. Um, over the past year or so, we've seen compelling use cases for item segments, part segments, and specific items to have different usage horizons in the uh, DDMRP methodology. And so we're going to be enabling that now in our part editor, such that you can override a part with say, uh, six weeks horizon for forecast or something in some uh, seasonal pattern that you're in. At the same time, we will maintain the hierarchy that we have today. Part will take precedent. The part level override will take precedent over the location setting. The location setting will take precedent over the global default. So not mandatory, of course, to update these at the part level, but you will be able to do this in part editor as well as uh, via CSV upload. Um, so I think that will, you know, it seems like such a small feature, but I think a lot of our clients will be excited by this. And I know that uh, many have asked for this uh, over the past couple of years. All right, two-tier architecture. I'm gonna do my best to explain this um, uh, given my technical acumen. So um, you've heard from some of these great customers over the last couple of days who are rolling out into flow into uh, dozens and dozens and potentially hundreds of sites and locations where you have planners running jobs in different times 
You've got interfaces that occur uh, in different time zones for different ERP systems, so on and so forth. This, of course, creates a lot of contention for you know, memory, CPU, et cetera, uh, job contention for the queue of jobs that have to run, so on and so forth. And so um, we set out on a journey last year to implement what we're calling two-tier architecture to help improve the experience for these users that have this great job and CPU contention, ultimately to improve performance and usability for these clients and, and really service our enterprise space. So basically we'll deploy a front end and one or more back end um, instances uh, for processing operations. Um, the user interface side where our actual users are using software won't, con won't be competing anymore with the background jobs or CPU and memory. And we think that will substantially improve performance. Um, we'll also have the ability to scale the backend for different clients, um, depending on their unique use case and data volume need, et cetera. So this is really a cornerstone, I think, of the, uh, you know, the forethought we have in the performance layer of our application to make sure that we're scaling as fast as our clients are. And so I'm really excited about this. And I think a lot of our clients on the call who do have these, you know, large implementations will be as well. We are releasing a DBR plus migrator, um, probably not pertinent to most of the, uh, the, the folks on the call today, but um, I think there was a question yesterday about upgrading to Intuit flow. We've got all these, you know, products together now, right? Many of our legacy users are using R plus and DBR plus on prem for them to move into to a flow. We want to make it easy. We want to be able to carry their data uh, from the tables in DBR plus on prem and have them seamlessly go into the new scheduling schema um, such that they can upgrade with these and immediately gain the benefit of using the new features and functionality in this great Intuitflow software. Uh, so this DBR Plus migrator will be released alongside our version uh, coming out in the second quarter. And I expect that we'll see a lot of adoption from our DBR, DBR Plus on-prem users after that point. All right. So those are kind of some of the core features that we're adding. Um, a lot of work to be done here. Um, you know, now that we have all three of these parts of the software together, we can really start branching out and thinking about where we want to take the software. What are the large grain features that we want to take on to improve this, you know, this total package of IBP solution that we're offering? One of the things that we've been working on for um, a solid 18 months now is a machine learning engine and the application of machine learning techniques into the Intuitful platform. We're, and you may have heard me talk about this before if you joined um, some of our other previous webinars, but I'm gonna go a little bit deeper today, show you a little bit more about how we're gonna surface it in the actual platform. Um, but essentially we're picking a very small scope to start, right? The number one thing that we wanna solve for is how do we size the red zones in our buffer? Right. This is kind of the secret sauce of DDMRP. Our yellow zones are set, our green zones are dictated by order policy. And the red zone is really where we can get the benefit of protecting us for service level while maintaining appropriate levels of inventory. Today, um, our consultants do this. A lot of our clients do this using the coefficient of variation. And that is simply the standard deviation divided by the average over some relevant rate, uh, time range, usually one year. And then we would categorize items based on that coefficient variation uh, to come up with our red zone base and ultimately our red zone safety. Um, this has been a really good method for us over the years. And I mean, you've heard over the past couple of days, all of the great results that our clients are getting um, in terms of sizing the red zones this way. That said, we think we can do better. We think we can automate it take the um, tribal knowledge that's required to make these settings out of the user and the consulting hands and really put it into a more scalable um, enterprise application using machine learning. If I look at COV between two parts here, this is a simple Excel mock-up uh, simulation for two different parts that have quite different variability in, in terms of the way their demand looks, right? Our top part here, you know, pretty regular demand. We've got some spiky behavior. We've got some lumps as well, um, but it's regular, it's reoccurring. 
it's uh, it doesn't look so scary from a variation standpoint, and it's producing a pretty solid buffer. Down here, I have a similar um, item that's also regular in its own right, but a little more clumpy, has larger gaps in, in terms of time between demand pulses, and ultimately requires different buffer settings in order to service the item in the best possible optimized way. So you can see here, I've got some days with three or four days straight of demand, some big couple month gaps in demand here. And I only have that up here. These, in this case, we've set these parts, they both yield the same coefficient of variation. And thus in most DDMRP applications would uh, result in having the same red zone settings. That's really not appropriate. And, um, you know, uh, what we're aiming to do is add these extra elements of uh, relative size of demand pulses, as well as the time array where the demand falls within a series to the algorithm to calculate appropriate variability settings. We think we can do this using pattern recognition. So today we have this idea of buffer profiling. We have variability categories based on COV and we bucket items into it. We want to maintain this um, buffer profile mindset where we're grouping like items together such that we don't have you know, one setting for every part in the system because that becomes precisely wrong in the world where words of uh, Carol Tech, right? We'd rather be roughly right, but we want to get a little more right with our, with our groupings here. So we're going to be using pattern recognition techniques and machine learning to um, look at demand signals as if they are uh, waves or um, much like a sound wave would here with Shazam, right? I can hold up my phone in a crowded restaurant to a song and it will tell me what song is playing. What it's doing is it's capturing the sound waves from that song. It's comparing it against a database um, and, and search and a search space for relative artists and songs. Well, we want to do the same thing. We want to take a part in its demand signal. We want to compare it against a client or later perhaps global database of the same demand pulses and find the most appropriate settings for those parts. We want to take similar um, demand signal or patterns and group them together such that we can assign group settings um, that are quite appropriate. We do this via what's called a um, a cluster. Okay, so in this case, it, this is a screenshot from our um, machine learning application. We have 189 parts in this cluster. Okay, and the cluster is a group of parts that have similar demand and variability more more importantly um, relative to their their the other parts in that cluster once we have a cluster we produce a centroid a centroid is a um, a representative demand pattern that represents the variability and demand for the whole group okay for these 189 parts we come up with this really i think cool looking um centroid representative demand pulse you can see within the part set here for the 189 parts, we have a varying range of coefficient of variabilities uh, that are representative. Uh, so a lot of low COV items, but then if I come out here, I've got some higher COV items as well. Turns out using the pattern recognition uh, application, we know that the COVs that are this big out here, these items should actually still be set with these items down here because even though their CRVs are widely dispersed, their actual um, demand signatures are quite the same. When we look at a, uh, a cluster, we're looking at the parts and we're looking for what we call nearest neighbors and farthest neighbors um, to make sure that parts are similar. And uh, we can really compare those both graph graphically, but more importantly, in the machine learning application um, to detect drift in parts and place them into different clusters. Again, an example of a centroid demand signal that comes out of a cluster. It's an exemplar signal that represents the entire group. What we're gonna do with this centroid demand signal is then after we've clustered parts together, we're going to simulate that centroid using uh, buffer settings that represent that group as well. And we're not gonna simulate it once, we're gonna use um, uh, a very, in-depth and long process to simulate potentially hundreds or thousands of times until we hone in on the proper settings for the red zone. In this case, at the end, um, after our whole simulation process is done, we've simulated this centroid and we've come up with 
um, a very appropriate red zone size for this specific cluster of parts. This um, cluster only has six parts. That's quite low for R&D purposes. Um, but hopefully it gives you an idea of how we're drawing the settings for the group of parts by simulating a single centroid. Once we're done with uh, simulating all of the centroids that represents the clusters, we're gonna be looking at the heuristics of the data to understand our on-hand and our service level at a macro level, not just a part level, but also the macro level. We're gonna go find parts that are outliers, right? We call this post-processing. After the jobs are done and the clustering is complete, we're gonna go back in and we're gonna say this part, even though it's in this cluster, isn't really getting appropriate settings at the part level. So we're gonna redo it. We're gonna put it in a different cluster until it's right. And the machine is doing this all by itself without any human intervention ultimately to produce an aggregate performance um, metric that we agree with and like. Um, by the way, in the machine learning paradigm, um, we're not always hunting for 100% service level. So constant availability is key. 100% service level is quite unrealistic for um, an aggregate data set of hundreds or dozens or sorry, thousands and thousands of parts. So when we surface the machine learning settings back into Intuitflow, as I'll talk about, we will give users the ability to choose between three different types of service levels. Um, perhaps you have ABC parts where you have a desire for 98, 95, and 90% service level in your business. You would be able to then choose that at the part level have the machine learning application send you back the best settings that satisfy that service level requirement. This is awesome because today we don't have that ability, right? We don't have the ability to dictate what service level uh, we want to see in the software for a part. And tomorrow we will have that ability. So it's a really exciting benefit of what we're doing here. Here's a quick, um, you know, flow diagram of how we're going to be working this. So, we have Intuit Flow, of course. We're going to be passing all of the relevant information. It's more than demand history, right? It's demand history, all the other item master data that we need to really produce a proper cluster and simulation environment. Separately from our application, so via an API, what we call the machine learning fabric, we'll send the data over to our machine learning engine. It will then go through the process that I described. We'll cluster the items and based on their demand variability signatures. We'll then determine the centroids or representative demand signal for each cluster. We will optimize around those centroids using simulations. And ultimately, we will apply those centroid settings to each part to judge the performance for that part. Once we've um, identified the outliers and kind of come back and redone the process here with simulated annealing, we will then send those settings back to the Intuitive Flow application, again, via the, uh, the same API, the, the machine learning fabric. And the, you will see in your Intuitive Flow instance, the ability to set different service levels um, using the machine learning um, uh, provided red zone settings. So it's a pretty, um, I think it's a pretty simple round trip. All the complexity is on the engine side. What we're actually gonna be building into the Intuitive Flow uh, solution is quite simple. It's a part level setting that says, Yes, I want to use machine learning for to judge the red zone for this specific part. Here is the service level that I require. You still have, of course, the option to use the typical COV produced buffer profiles. Um, and this will be uh, a part level option for you to manage such that we can test it with individual parts, groups of parts. And I think eventually we'll see clients adopt this uh, in mass throughout their, their data sets. Okay, um, regarding the testing of your, I've got a question here. So regarding the testing of your clusters, what type of overall percentage increases or, de or, or decreases have you seen with red zones? Um, it's really, uh, it's all over. Um, what we've seen, Sean, in some cases, we see uh, parity with current data sets that we have, depending on you know the complexity of the demand variations. Where we've really seen, I think, great benefit from applying this machine learning application is with uh, clients that are data sets that have long tails of odd variation, where you have very high runners, you have some medium users, and then you have a long tail of quite variable parts. The hardest thing for me, I think, in DDMRP 
um, if I'm implementing per se, is to make sure that I'm putting all of the right settings with the right parts. If I look at the highest runners within our clients, the most important parts, we usually have the right settings on those because they're very, very important to us, right? So we're usually doing a great job managing and judging the settings for those parts. But if I look across 20,000 parts for a client, it's really hard to do that, right? If I myself go and use my simulation tool to um, hunt and peck for the best settings, that's always going to be the best thing, right? I'll be able to do that for every single part, um, but it would also be, it would take me over a year to do this for most clients. So the idea here is to get more parts with the right settings, right? And depending on how clients are set today and depending on the overall variation or variability amongst the part set that we're judging, um, we expect that we can see really good gains in terms of inventory reduction while maintaining the same service level. But also, um, again, we have, we'll have that ability to, to actually set the service level um, for different parts, which has many, many benefits in itself. We don't have that today. It's a great question. Um, we're still obviously in the heavy R&D phase for this, um, for this application. When we uh, surface this in Intuitflow, we'll be asking clients to help us, right? To, te to test with us, to judge the settings against each other. Um, what we're doing today is we're running simulations in the advanced planning module, or sorry, the SNOP module against what's outputting in the ML environment, comparing those and we're seeing good results. Um, by the way, the machine learning functionality, when we do service it in TwoFlow, um, it will be a licensed module, but we're not charging for it, right? We want clients to sign up for this. Um, we have to sign a data anonymization agreement. When we pull the data from your system, we'll be anonymizing that data uh, because it's going into this global database with uh, our machine learning engine. And then we de-anonymize it when we send it back to the client instance. So we sign the data agreement, we turn it on for you, we allow you to start using it. My goal is to get as many clients as I can using the software because the more data that we have, um, the more R&D and ultimately the more the machine can learn, right? Um, across our entire global client base, we have millions and millions of parts. Um, and you can imagine the power of the machine being able to comb through and recognize patterns within that, that global part set in order to produce the best results. Okay. Yeah, so I think I've already covered this, but we're maintaining the grouping mechanism. This is very important. We're not setting part level settings. Um, we're still grouping like items together via these clusters. And ultimately we, we believe that buffer performance will improve and we'll have this ability to control service level. All right, um, how are we doing on time? We're good on time, so I'm gonna keep going. So let's have a look at, um, just briefly, at our preliminary roadmap for the second half of the year. I've already talked today about our second quarter. Um, I just went through all these features, or most of these features, in the previous slides. Let's switch our focus to the third quarter and the fourth quarter. Now that we have scheduling, SNOP and materials planning alongside each other in the cloud, it really opens us up from a product and development standpoint to um, build a lot of brilliant ancillary features and functionality to greatly improve the user experience for our clients. And that's what we're aiming to do in the second half of 2022. So I'll go through these very quickly. Um, this is, by the way, not set in stone at all um, in terms of the third and fourth quarter. We're still going to be moving things about and shuffling things as we reprioritize and begin specification for these features. But I think this is uh, highly representative of where we're headed. We want to work on alternate bomb functionality or really more bomb effectivity dates, which I think Young so cast about earlier in the question. We want to enable bomb effectivity dates for our clients in the third quarter. Um, intelligent adjustments is the idea that we can use the output from our SNOP module to judge where we should apply adjustment factors and potentially um, adjustments to settings in the materials planning environment. So if my SNOP tool spits out that I've got a potential stock out based on my forecasted demand in uh, you know, three months, we want the system, we don't want the user to have to go through and find that and then apply an adjustment factor as they do today. We want the system to recommend, say, hey, uh, 
Mrs. User, you've got a stock out coming up potentially, and we recommend that you apply this adjustment factor to this group of parts. That's what it is. Uh, so it's really exciting. Um, Bernard and his team have already done a lot of this um, outside of the software using some really neat models that are going to serve as the base for this functionality. And uh, we really hope to surface this very, very soon. We want to improve our smart buffer profiler functionality um, to have saved runs, uh, historical um, runs so that you can detect and rerun things month after month rather than keeping track of the settings yourself. Um, there's some other really cool functionality we want, to, we want to enable there as well around simulations so that when you're running Smart Buffer Profiler, you can simulate the, the projected output of those changes. It'd be very cool. Quota management relates to, you know, having a share of, let's say I want to purchase 50% from one vendor, 50% from another vendor. We want our SNOP output and potentially our actual ordering to reflect that, uh, that quota. So we're working on that. Simulation modeling is um, really at the part level, being able to model and judge the change um, of settings into a part without actually changing the settings, right? More of a sandbox environment at the part level, uh, which would allow me to simulate using forecast or demand history, how a buffer profile change would impact my results. So I've actually already seen a uh, working uh, demonstration of this this week from one of our developers. So very, very cool. And uh, that's going to be a great enhancement for our SNOP users. Other SNOP enhancements. Um, we have a really in great cornerstone for SNOP with our functionality that we have today, right? We've got this quite robust simulation tool. Um, we've added the ability to use MRP in the SNOP tool to net demand from the forecast all the way through the build material in the, in the most effective way. Now we need to use it, right? We need to be able to make it usable for the clients. So we already talked about intelligent adjustments, but it's also running different scenarios and um, saving those scenarios and comparing those, right? It's using the capacity constrained view that's an output of our rough cut capacity planning module to rerun the output of the SNOP module, um, baking in capacity. So we can see what our actual supply and inventory projections will be um, based on the capacity plan. Um, so a lot to come on the SNOP side. Um, and that's sort of the, that's sort of where we want to go with SNOP enhancements. We're not going to be able to do everything at once, but we really want to focus on in the second half this year, um, adding new functionality to S the SNOP tool uh, which will be a great benefit to our clients. Let's see, hyperparameterization in AI ML, this is just the, the next phase of um, uh, machine learning that's going to allow the tool actually itself to decide and judge the settings for each client uh, rather than having uh, human intervention at the beginning of that process. And this is at the very bottom here, I'll skip down here to Power BI Embedded. Um, today, we have a built-in uh, business intelligence tool that many of our users are utilizing to build custom reports and dashboards in the Intuflow software. We will be replacing that, um, the tool that we have baked in today into the software with Power BI Embedded. So um, Power BI Embedded is going to be a lot more, uh, it's going to be easier for us to support. It's going to be more scalable, give us more options for our clients. And uh, ultimately, if you've used Power BI, you know that it's absolutely one of the best in class uh, business intelligence tools. Our users will be able to go to a reports page right in their Intuful instance to access the Power BI dashboards, both that we provide and potentially that our clients provide as well. So that will be coming um, in the later part of this year. But look out to Q4, some important enhancements. Uh, we're gonna be making some changes to the way we display build materials. We're going to be adding on to our shelf life um, enhancements that I talked about yesterday, uh, enhancing our note feature. Demand history outlier detection. Um, we have this request all the time. How do we deal with outliers and how do we manually and potentially autom automatically adjust our demand history to be reflective of our reality in the system? Um, there's a lot to think about there, um, but it's something that we're exploring right now and I think is a really important feature for us. We want to add on to the multi-source functionality that we have to include distribution and eventually manufacturing as well. So I can make the decision between 
buy, make, and distribute right within the application if I have those options in my actual client environment. We talked about SNP scenario planning, um, parallel resource, resource scheduling there. We want to create more AI ML automation. Once we've um, really proven this out with many of our clients, we want to combine that functionality with our auto approval functionality um, to create more automation, which I'll talk about in the next slide. Changes to our uh, administrator and user management user interface to make it more scalable. Again, if we talk about hundreds of plans for a client, we've got to make improvements here to make that a reality. And, uh, and some more technical and architecture enhancements with parallel job queues. So um, it's a tremendous amount of work to be done here in the second half of 2022. We're in a really good position to do it though. Um, now that we have scheduling in the cloud. So we've sort of caught up with all of that. Um, we've made some great enhancements to our, uh, our, our architecture of our software, and we're ready to go off and tackle all of these great features. Um, so I think if we look at the end of this year, we're gonna uh, have an amazing piece of software uh, that's really um, enabled in the most appropriate way for our clients to get and continue to get great value, just like we, uh, we've been hearing our clients talk about today. In terms of where we want to go long term, um, Eric has been talking about this a lot in some webinars and different meetings and things like that. So this with our clients. I really want to stress it here today. Our goal is to make this completely complex environment um, that our clients face in supply chain feel very simple, right? From a materials planning, scheduling, and SNOP standpoint. Um, we always talk about the SpaceX Dragon capsule, right? We've got civilians flying to space. They don't know how to fly. They don't know how to do anything in space, but the machine is doing everything for them, right? We're flying to space in an automated fashion. Um, we've got self-driving cars all around the world now that can literally drive from point A to point B without a human touching the steering wheel. Both of these scenarios, just like the, you know, the pilot in the Delta flight scenario, um, lives are on the line. Right. This is very critical that these applications and these um, algorithms work properly. But still, if I look at you know supply chain and where we're at today with supply chain, um, we're doing planning so manually, and there's so many settings and switches and knobs and spreadsheets that enable this process. We want to we want to really um, enhance this industry such that we can be on autopilot for uh, the core materials that we plant and produce in our client environment. So right now we're scratching the surface. We've got some cool machine learning uh, ability. It's a very niche application in our software. We continue to add robust features around our software, but as we think about you know, forward looking into 2023 and beyond, we're gonna be making a concerted effort to also drive this initiative alongside you know, the features that we're building for our clients and, uh, and our prospects. Um, to really make headway in this in this autopilot space. So more to come on that, but I hope that you can see the value in that vision and share that vision with uh, with demand and technologies, um, because we really think we can change things in supply chain software. I believe that is my last slide, and I I think I'm right on time. So if there are any other questions, I can take a couple minutes to answer those. Else, we will be switching over to the fourth annual World's Most Riveting Panel Discussion. No questions so far, Eric. I must Man, have... You got to say that with enthusiasm. <laughs> I can't do it like you. Um, <laughs> you know, after four years, I'm just, I'm just worn out on the world's most riveting, but I'm sure that you will make it better than ever this year. No questions, Eric. So I must have absolutely uh, explained everything. Nailed it once again, huh? Again. So I'll turn it over to you, my friend.